Okay, so for number one, it says factor completely. So remember, factoring means to write something that's either an addition or subtraction expression and try to change that into some sort of multiplication expression. So if I'm looking at number one, I notice there are two terms, and 4 is a perfect square, and 49 is a perfect square. Since they're being subtracted, I know this is a difference of two squares problem. And the way I figure out what to put there is by taking the square root of both of them to see that the square root of 4x squared is 2x, and the square root of 49 is 7. So I write two sets of parentheses. I put 2x in the first spot in both of them, and 7 in the second spot in both of them. One of them is going to have a plus connecting them. The other one's going to have a minus connecting them. And if we wanted to distribute this all out, we'd see that this expression right here is exactly the same as this expression right here. They only look different. So for number 2, I notice that same problem where it's subtraction and it's two things that look like they could be perfect squares. So if I take the square root of x squared over 9, the square root of x squared is x and the square root of 9 is 3. Don't be scared that this is a fraction. All your rules still work even if it's a fraction. And the square root of 25, y to the 6. Well, the square root of 25 is 5. And I need to ask myself, what times itself would get the exponent of 6 for the y? And that's going to be y cubed. Because y to the third times y to the third would be y to the sixth. So I do the same thing where I set up my two sets of parentheses. The first one's going to be x minus 3 plus 5y cubed times x over 3 minus 5y cubed. Okay, for number 3. I notice this problem's a little bit different than the last two because instead of two terms, there's one, two, three, four terms. Anytime you see four terms, you should always be thinking to yourself, factor by grouping. So the process for grouping is we look at the first two terms and we look at the second two terms. In the first two terms, I ask myself, what's the GCF between both these that I could pull out? The first term has an x to the third and the second term has an x squared. So I know I could pull out an x squared. And between the 3 and the 2, it doesn't look like there's anything I could divide out there. So I'm left within that first set of parentheses, 3x plus 2. And then I look at the next two terms. Okay, negative 27x and negative 8. I want to try to pull something out so that when I'm left with a set of parentheses here, I still have that 3x plus 2. So I'm going to try to pull out a negative 9. When I divide negative 27x by negative 9, I get 3x, and negative 18 divided by negative 9 is positive 2. Now I notice that these parentheses are the same, which if you do factor by grouping correctly will always happen. So I could rewrite it as 3x plus 2 times, just rewriting what I have left, x squared minus 9. Now, notice that this x squared minus 9 is a difference of two squares. So we can factor this further into x plus 9, excuse me, x plus 3 times x minus 3. Because the square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 9 is 3. For number 4, we see x squared times y plus 3x squared minus y minus 3. Again, there's four terms, so we could do the same thing we did last time. From the first two terms, we could pull out an x squared, and we're left with y plus 3. And from the next two terms, I want to make it so it says y plus 3 over here. So I'm thinking to myself, maybe if I just pull out a negative 1, I'll be left with that. Okay, negative y divided by negative 1 is y, and negative 1 divided by negative 3 is positive 3. Okay, so that worked out. I'm left with y plus 3 times whatever I have left there, x squared minus 1. Now, 1, even though it doesn't look like it, 1 is a perfect square because 1 times 1 is 1. So I could factor this even further to y plus 3 times x plus 1 
times x minus 1. Number 5. I have three terms, so I know it's not difference of two squares, and I know it's not factor by grouping. So I'm going to try to factor this the same way I factor regular trinomials, where I have an x in the first spot, and then I ask myself what multiplies to negative 18, but adds to positive 3. So factors of 18, well, 6 and 3 look like they're going to work, but if I want it to be positive 3, that 3 is going to have to be negative. So I put minus 3 here and plus 6 here. Now the only thing that changes when you have two variables is you just have to have a y attached to both those n terms there. Because if you think about getting that last term negative 18y squared, when you multiply, if you're trying to distribute back out to check, you get x squared plus 6xy minus 3xy and then negative 3 times 6 is negative 18 y times y is y squared so I get that term I wanted to get there and I can combine like terms in the middle to get exactly what we started with I recommend doing that for each of these factoring problems so that you could check yourself to make sure you factored correctly for number 6 the first thing you always look for when you're factoring is a GCF. So I look at 128x to the fourth and 2x, and I notice that they're both even, so I could divide them by 2. And they both have at least one x, so I could divide them both by x. So when I'm factoring, I write whatever I divided out on the outside of the parentheses, and I'm left with 64x cubed minus 1. Now, you always want to ask yourself, am I finished? Did I factor all the way? And this one's a little tricky to see because you notice it's two terms, so maybe you're thinking it's going to be dots. But I see that x to the third. So I know it can't be dots because it's not a square. But they are both perfect cubes. So what we can do is we can abide by our difference of two cubes formula. A, if I have a cubed minus b cubed, that simply factors into a minus b times a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Kind of ran out of them there. So we just need to identify what our a and our b terms are in order to plug in. Once we could do that, we just plug into the formula and then we're done. There will never be any more factoring you have to do after that. So I'm just going to bring down the 2x, and I ask myself, what would I have to multiply to itself three times to get 64? And I know that 4 times 4 times 4 is 64, so my a term must be 4x, because x cubed, and my b term, well, 1 times 1 times 1 is still 1, so I'm just going to make b1. Now don't worry about that there's a negative here. The fact that it's a negative is taken into account by that formula. So just pick whatever positive value you have. So my a term, 4x, minus my b term, times my a term squared, plus 2 times my a term, times my b term, plus my b term squared. And you could simplify that if you want to, to 16x squared, and make that 8x, but there's no reason to. If you recognize that this is a difference of two cubes, you're good to go. For number 7, I notice that there are three terms, so I'm hoping I could factor this like a regular trinomial. But I notice that it's an x to the fourth instead of x squared now. So normally this is going to be x and x, and I multiply them and get an x squared term right there. But if I want to get x to the fourth term, I just need to make these x squared instead. And I ask myself all the same questions. What multiplies to negative 20 but adds to that positive 1 right there? Well, it looks like 4 and 5 are going to work, and 4 has to be negative. So I'd make it x squared plus 5, x squared minus 4. Now again, you always ask yourself, are you finished? 
x squared minus 4. That looks familiar. Something squared minus 4 is just 2 squared. So that's something squared minus something squared. So you could factor that further into a difference of 2 squares. So x plus whatever is being squared times x minus whatever is being squared. Notice I'm not getting an answer. I'm not getting x equals for any of these. I'm not setting it equal to 0. These questions are just asking to factor, not to solve. That'll be the next set of problems. So for number 8, if I see a number in front of the x, the first thing I want to do is I want to see if I could divide that out of all my terms. But the problem is that middle term isn't divisible by 2. So here we use the headphone method or factor by grouping again. So if I multiply the a and the c term, 2 times negative 6 is negative 12, and I ask myself what multiplies to negative 12 and adds to that middle term right there, that negative 1. So let's see, 6 and 2, that's not going to work. 4 and 3 might work if the 4 is negative. Negative 4 plus 3 would get me negative 1. And what we do is we split the middle term. So I rewrite my first term, and I change negative x into negative 4x plus 3x. And I rewrite my last term. Now, this is just a factor by grouping problem. When we look at the first two terms, pull out something. Look at the next two terms and pull out something. We can pull out a 2x from the first set and be left with x minus 2. And we could pull out a positive 3 and be left with x minus 2 again. So our final answer would be x minus 2 times 2x plus 3. For number 9, solve by taking the square root. So if you wanted to, you could rewrite this and distribute it all out and then get it into standard form and just use the quadratic equation or the quadratic formula. But this is a lot easier solved by just dividing by 2 on both sides and getting x minus 40 squared equals 20 and then just taking the square root to get rid of that square there. But remember, every time you take a square root in an equation, make sure to take the plus or minus square root, because when you have a quadratic or something squared, you're always going to want to get two solutions. So if you finish and you only have one solution, ask yourself, well, did I remember to do the plus or minus there? So we could add 40 on both sides. And we're left with x equals 40 plus or minus radical 20. Now, you could leave your answer like this, but I'm looking at this radical 20 right here. And it looks like it can be simplified a little bit. Because radical 20 is the same thing as radical 4 times radical 5, which would just simplify to 2 radical 5. So that would be a little bit cleaner of a final answer. Number 10, solve by factoring. Well, in order to solve any quadratic by factoring or by using the quadratic formula, if you look at something like number 11, notice that it's equal to 0. So I want to try to rewrite number 10 so that it's equal to 0. So I can add 2x on both sides and subtract 10 on both sides. And I'm left with x squared plus 5x minus 24 equals 0. And there's no number in front of the x squared, so I could factor this like a regular trinomial. I ask myself what multiplies to 24 and adds to that middle term 5. So 8 and 3, but they need to multiply to negative 24, so 8 and negative 3 would work. So I write two sets of parentheses with x in the front for both of them. One of them is going to have x minus 3, the other one's going to have x plus 8. From there, I am solving these. I'm not just factoring them. So I want to end up getting an answer. So I set both of these expressions equal to 0, and I get x equals positive 3 and x equals negative 8. So when I write these as an answer, I could just leave it as x equals 3 and x equals negative 8. Don't try to write them using parentheses 
because then this ends up looking like an ordered pair where you've got an x and a y term. So don't write them like that. Just leave them as x equals and x equals. Number 11. Solve by quadratic formula. So if you don't remember the quadratic formula, that'll be given to you on every test because it's given to you on the regions. But the quadratic formula is just x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. Now, it's already equal to 0, so the way I get these a, b, and c terms is just by looking for a quadratic that looks like this. And I notice that in our equation, the a term is going to be equal to 2, the b is going to be positive 7, and the c is going to be negative 30. So I just take these values and substitute them into this formula. So x equals negative 7 plus or minus the square root of 7 squared minus 4. My a is 2, my c is negative 30, and 2 times my a, which is 2. Now once you're at this step, don't try to plug it all in at once. Do it piece by piece and hope that it works out where it's a perfect square. Otherwise, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So, I'm not even going to take the radical yet. I'm just going to plug that 7 squared minus 4 times 2 times negative 30 into my calculator. And I get 289. Notice that a negative times a negative will get me a positive. So this is going to end up being 7 squared plus something else over 4. And if I plug radical 289 into my calculator, 289 is a perfect square. So this just ends up looking like x equals negative 7 plus or minus 17 over 4. So since it was a perfect square, I'm going to get a rational number. So I'm just going to split this into both of my answers. So x equals negative 7 plus 17 over 4. So negative 17 plus 7, or negative 7 plus 17 is 10, divided by 4 is 2.5, and negative 7 minus 17 over 4 just gets negative 6. So those would be your two solutions for number 11. For number 12, I need to solve by the quadratic formula again, but just make sure you subtract 6x on both sides to get it equal to 0 first. So you do the same thing. You label an A. Oops. Before I can do that, make sure it's in standard form. So x squared, and then an x term, and then a constant. So I'm just going to rewrite this a little bit. 9x squared minus 6x plus 1 equals 0. Now I can label this as my A, label this as my B, and label this as my C. If I do this in this previous step, notice I won't get the same answer because it's not x squared and then my x term and then a constant. So make sure it's in standard form equal to zero before you start doing anything. Okay, so I plug into the formula again, x equals, my B is negative 6, so a negative negative 6 is just going to be positive 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 6 squared minus 4 times 9 times 1 all over 2 times 9. So if I simplify a little bit, x equals 6 plus or minus negative 6 squared is 36 and negative 4 times 9 times 1 is negative 36. So you end up getting 36 minus 36 under the radical. Make sure you have those parentheses around that negative 6 when you plug it into your calculator. Otherwise, you'll get the wrong answer. So I could just rewrite that as radical 0 over 18. Now, radical 0 is just the same thing as 0. So if I'm trying to think about 6 plus 0 over 18 and 6 minus 0 over 18, that's going to get me the same answer as one-third and one-third. So we still got two answers, but they're just the same answer this time. 
number 13. Solve by completing the square. So remember completing the square is when you take half of the b term, you square it, and you add it to both sides. But before I even start that, I notice these are all divisible by 2. So I'm just going to start by dividing everything by 2. I get x squared plus 7x plus 4. 0 divided by 2 is still 0. So I move the c term over first to so that constant, x squared plus 7x plus, and I'm going to leave a space there, and negative 4 plus, I'm going to leave a space there. So my b term is 7, and when I divide that by 2 and square it, I get 49 over 4. Hmm. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, I got a fraction, so there's no way this can be right. But try to get out of that habit, because for Algebra 2, a lot of these problems are going to be a little bit more difficult than Algebra 1, where you'd always get integers. Sometimes it's going to work out like this. So this is the correct process here. When we go to factor this trinomial on the left-hand side, it's always going to be x plus whatever half your b term was, squared. So even if you don't know what adds to 7 and multiplies to 49 over 4, just look at whatever half your b term is. That'll tell you what to put in those parentheses. And negative 4 plus 49 over 4 is just 33 over 4. Now you could write it as a decimal if you want. I'm going to round this answer to the nearest hundredth anyway. I'm just going to leave it as a fraction for this. So I take the square root. Take the square root. I'm going to keep writing over here. So x plus 7 over 2 equals plus or minus radical 33 over 4. Subtract 7 over 2 on both sides. And you're left with x equals negative 7 over 2 plus radical 33 over 4. And x equals negative 7 over 2 minus radical 34 over 4. So neither of these answers are pretty, but the work makes sense. We didn't make any mistakes. We took half of b, we squared it, added it to both sides. We didn't make any sign errors. So both these answers are okay. You could clean them up and simplify and maybe round to the nearest hundredth, but if they don't tell you to, you could leave your answer however you want as long as the numerical value is correct. Okay, number 14. Solve by graphing and finding the x-intercepts. So I've got this equation right here. If I want to solve this by graphing, I can go to my y equals screen on my calculator and just type in negative 5x squared minus 2x plus 6. And I'm just looking for when it hits the x-axis. So I've already graphed it already. I've got it over here, this orange function. Let me zoom in a little bit. So I'm looking for the x-intercepts, where it's crossing the x-axis. So if I look in my calculator, you could use the trace function using those sheets you got today that showed you about the max and the min. And I noticed that at x equals negative 1.314, and the other one was x equals, and these are just rounded values, 0 0.914, that's when the graph crosses the x-axis. So if I'm rounding to the nearest hundredth, Remember the place values are tenth, hundredth, tenth, hundredth. So my two answers would be x equals negative 1.31 and x equals 0 0.91. Now, if they don't tell you how you're supposed to solve it and they tell you round to the nearest hundredth, usually quadratic formula or graphing are going to be the two foolproof methods to always get the right answer here. Graphing, you'll only be able to get an approximate value because you'll need to round it. But quadratic formula, you could always get whatever the irrational number is because you'll have that radical there. Number 15. Determine whether a squared plus 3b times a squared minus 4b equals a to the fourth minus 12b squared is an identity. Explain your answer. So remember an identity is an equation that is true for any value of the variable. 
So whether I plug in a equals 1 and b equals 0, or a equals 4 and b equals 6, I should always get the same number on both sides of the equation. So you could do that by plugging in numbers. I'm going to do this algebraically, though. So I'm going to distribute it out the left side and see what I get. So a squared times a squared is a to the fourth, minus 4a squared b, plus 3a squared b, minus 12b squared. If I clean up this middle, I'm left with a to the fourth, minus 1a squared b, minus 12b squared. And I want to see if that's equal to a to the fourth minus 12b squared. I didn't change the right-hand side at all. So I notice that the a to the fourth is the same and the minus 12b is the same. But I've got this extra term in the middle here. So if I'm looking to see if this equation is an identity, I would say no. Reason being is the expression I have on the left-hand side isn't exactly the same as the expression I have on the right-hand side. It's got that extra term in the middle there. So if I plug in a number for a and b, it won't always be the same value on both sides of the equal sign. Number 16. Given the quadratic function in vertex form, f of x equals negative 4 times x plus 1 squared plus 16. Determine the following. So remember vertex form of a parabola looks like this, x minus h squared plus k, where the coordinates h comma k represented the vertex. So I don't even need to do any work here to figure out that the y coordinate of the vertex is 16. And the x, well in the formula it's x minus h, so you could just take whatever the opposite sign of what's in the parentheses is. So negative 1 comma 16. To see if the function's concave up or down, so whether it's concave up or smiley face or concave down or frowny face, I look at the leading coefficient or that number out in front there. I notice that it's negative, so that's going to mean that it's concave down. Since it's concave down, I know I'm not looking at this picture, I'm looking at this picture right here. So the vertex has to represent a maximum, the highest value it reaches there. Remember, the turning point is that vertex. So I would say that the vertex in this case represents a max. If it was concave up, it would represent a min. Now to find the zeros of the function. The zeros of the function are asking for when you set f of x equal to 0, what are you going to get? 4x. What x value makes the function equal to 0? So you could do this algebraically by subtracting 16 on both sides, getting negative 16 equals negative 4 times x plus 1 squared. Now notice this looks very similar to one that we did before. You can divide by negative 4, divide by negative 4. You get positive 4 equals x plus 1 squared, square root, square root plus or minus 2 equals x plus 1. Don't forget the plus or minus, because we should have two solutions here. And subtracting 1 on both sides. So you get that x equals negative 1 plus or minus 2. Or negative 1 plus 2 is just positive 1. And negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. So my zeros happen at x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 1. If you didn't want to do it algebraically, you could always just graph the function and look at where it intersects the x-axis. Notice that it happens at positive 1 and at negative 3, just like what we have here. So state the domain and range. Remember, the domain is how far left and right it goes. For a quadratic, if I zoom out here, looks like it goes left and right forever, but for the range, so for the domain I'm going to put negative infinity to positive infinity, but for the range I know my graph has a maximum value and just by the looks of it it goes down forever so I know it keeps going to negative infinity but the highest value it reaches is going to be at that vertex right there and we already know that the y value there is 16 
since y can be equal to 16, it's going to be a hard bracket. Now it says describe the transformation from the parent function. Well, in order to do that, you need to remember that the parent function is just good old x squared. Nothing done to the quadratic, no shifts left or right, no vertical stretches or shrinks. And just go piece by piece. For most of these, the order won't matter, but I'll start inward and work my way outward. That plus one, remember that's a horizontal shift. That means that you go left one unit, that 4 means vertical stretch by a factor of 4, and the negative means reflect over the x-axis, and that plus 16 is just taking all your y values and moving them up 16. So that just makes you go up 16. So as long as you can identify what each of those numbers does in the equation, it doesn't matter what order you do them in for now. Just worry about if it's multiplying, it's going to be a vertical stretch or shrink. If it's adding inside the parentheses, that's going to be some sort of horizontal shift. And if it's outside the parentheses, that's some sort of vertical shift. Now, if I want to rewrite this f of x equals negative 4 times x plus 1 squared plus 16, in standard form, I just need to distribute. So instead of writing x plus 1 squared, I'm going to write x plus 1 times x plus 1. And I'm going to distribute it out. So I'm going to keep my negative form. I'm not going to do anything with that yet. And I'm going to distribute. x times x is x squared. And you'll get plus 2x plus 1 and still a plus 16 here. Now I can distribute that negative 4 into my parentheses to get negative 4x squared minus 8x minus 4, and I've still got a plus 16 hanging out. So notice that it's not an x squared plus x plus something yet. I've still got these two like terms I can combine. So negative 4 plus 16 is just positive 12. Now if you go into your calculator and graph this function right here, it'll be the exact same graph as the one from 16. We didn't do anything to change the value, we only changed the way it looked. So for number 18, we can also do that by rewriting in an intercept form. Now intercept form shows the x-intercepts. So for example, if this, is, was my, if this was my function, f of x equals x minus a times x minus b, when I set it equal to 0, I would get x equals a and x equals b as my two intercepts. So let's try to think back to number 16, where the intercepts were negative 3 and 1. And I know that the number on the outside was negative 4, so it's not going to be positive 4. And if I want my zeros to be negative 3 and positive 1, I need to look for which one of these equations has the opposite signs of what I have here. So it needs to be a plus 3 and a minus 1. So the only one that fits that is D. Again, if you go into y equals and graph this function at the same time that you graph each of those other two functions, you'll get the exact same graph. So you always have a way to check yourself just by plugging into the calculator and graphing them. So if I want to write a quadratic that's in standard form that has zeros of 8 and 11, all we need to do is remember how intercept form works. If I can write it so that it's x plus something and x minus something, such when I set it equal to 0, I get 8 and 11, I know it's going to work. So think back to the last problem we just did. If I want my zeros to be positive 8 and positive 11, I could just stick in there x equals negative 8 and x equals negative 11. The reason why this works is because if I set that function equal to 0, when I solved it, 
I would get plus 11 plus 11, x equals 11, so 11 would be one of my zeros, and I would get x equals 8. So, you just need to remember to take the opposite sign of whatever you want your zeros to be.